If you would, open your Bibles to Mark and chapter number 15. Mark and chapter number 15. As we, here at the Crossroad Baptist Church, we've been going through the book of Mark. We're about a year and a half into this study. And so, once you find uh, Mark chapter 15, I invite you to stand as we honor God with a reading of his word. Mark chapter 15. We're going to begin in reading in verse number 16. Mark 15 and verse number 16. Here we have where Mark writes, And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head. And began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they and they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and of Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him into the place, Golgotha, which is the being interpreted the place of the school, of a school. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take, and it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the subscription of his accusation was written, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressor, transgressions, that's, of course, Psalm 22. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyeth the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the Scribes, he saved others. Himself can he not save. He cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone... Let, uh, uh, let alone let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent from, in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. There were also women looking afar off, among whom Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the, the less, and Joseph the, and Solomon, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, 
which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph, and he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in, the, in a sepulcher which was hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone uh, un, unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. Uh, let's pray. Father, as we are to the teaching and preaching part of the service, Father, I ask once again that you would empty me of myself, Father, that you would cleanse me of my sin and that you would fill me with thine Holy Spirit that I may preach. Thus saith the word of the Lord. Father, as we have come to our study, the crucifixion of Jesus, Lord, I ask that you would help us this morning all to be focused in on your word, on the message. Father, that we would not allow Satan to buy for our time that or we would put down any cell phones or social media or anything else that might take away the focus, Lord, from your word this morning. Father, I ask that you would have your will and your way in the rest of the service this morning. And thank you, Father, for the opportunity to declare your word. Lord, I ask you to do all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. A couple of weeks ago, we discussed about Pilate and Jesus coming before Pilate and talked about this was a day that Pilate really was not expecting. Um, and everything we talked about, how Pilate, when he heard he was a Galilee and sent him to Herod, and Herod sent him back to Pilate and everything that happened there and if we look at Mark chapter 15, and we go back to verse 15, where it says, And Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. If you go into every gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels don't go into great detail about the scourging. We get the details about him placing the crown of thorns on his head. We get them about placing the robe and all the mocking and uh, what the soldiers did there. But the, the Gospels don't go into great detail about the scourging. We have to go back into history to find out about what really happened there. And uh, about, of course, we know the cat of nine tails that they used to the, that the Romans would use to well, whip their victims, and we know about the, the glass and the stones and everything that was tied onto that leather whip and the damage that it would cause. And, and we go back into history and we, we, we learn about those things, but the, the point of the Gospels is not to spend time in details about the scourging and every detail that went on in the scourging, the, the mission of the Gospels uh, about the crucifixion of Jesus is not the details of the scourging, but the details of why he died in the first place. That's the point, uh, is of Jesus dying on the cross. And, uh, we, you know, we can take a message and talk about the nails, and we can talk about the spear that went up into his side, and all uh, not spend time on details, on that, but if we did that, we might miss maybe the importance of why Jesus died. Why the death, why the burial, and also why the resurrection of Jesus. As we read here in Mark chapter 15, we see Mark's account. Of course, Mark is pen pinning uh, what Peter is telling him, and as Mark here writes, uh, we see... Uh, the scene of after Pilate scourges him about the crucifixion. We see in, in verses uh, 16 through 20, we have the rejection of Jesus. Not a, we, we've already seen that the chief priests rejected and 
uh, had a mockery of a trial and brought him to Pilate. But we see not only uh, that they've done it, but we see the rejection of, of Rome and everyone else. And in verse 16, and it says that the soldiers led him away into the hall uh, call, uh, called Praetorium, and they called together, it says, the whole band. So what we see here in verse 16 is the whole band of soldiers. This is not just a handful of soldiers. These are hundreds of soldiers. That are The whole band of soldiers came together, and listen, we know that the Romans, listen, they really hated the Jews, didn't they? If you go and you read about history of the, uh, of the Romans and the Jews and learn how much, they dis, uh, how much disdain that they, the Romans had for the Jews and, and whatnot, and now uh, they have an opportunity to do something that, uh, to a Jew that is labeled the king of the Jews to really get out some anger and to get out some hostility maybe that they had against the Jews. And so we see here they bring the whole band to Jesus and begin to mock him. One thing I like about that, I've had this many times, any of y'all seen that series, The Chosen, right? Uh, one thing I like about that series is when they, in, the, in the scenes of that series, they always bring up uh, the praetor and those that, of the Romans, and they really show, those actors really show and portray the disdain that the Romans had for the Jews. Every time in that show they would talk about the Jews, it was just like filth. You know, they just couldn't stand being there and talking about uh, uh, being there with the Jews. And so now we see these band of soldiers, these hundreds of soldiers, having Jesus right there with them that Pilate has labeled king of the Jews, they began to let out some frustration. Now, he's already been scourged. He's already been whipped with the cat of nine tails, right? And we, we know of what all that details, and I'm not going to go through the grossly details but of that, but they clothed him with purple. So with his body being the way it is after being scourged with the cat of nine tails, they placed this robe, this purple robe, which we know that uh, purple is associated with royalty. They throw it on him, and they, 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 they get a crown of thorns, and they place it on his head, and they, they get a reed, which is basically essentially like a broom handle. They beat him with the reed. They place this crown of thorns on his head, and they place this robe on him, and it says that they even get on their knees and bow, hell, bow, to their, bow down and, and say, hell, king of the Jews, and worship, uh, mockingly worship Jesus, getting ready to put him on a cross. They're, they're letting out this frustration. And then before they take him and, and, put it, and put that beam on his back to carry the cross, they take that robe and they just rip it right off of his body. Most of us don't like a Band-Aid being ripped off of our skin, do we? Can you imagine? Listen, the human body is amazing. When God created, listen, God, when he created the human body, I'm thankful uh, uh, of the wisdom that he has, that as soon as we hurt our human body, we get a cup, the, uh, a cut on our arms, our body, the cells automatically start beginning to heal that cut. So when they place that robe on him, can you imagine uh, uh, just the, the amount of pain when the body started healing and that robe was connected, the blood being stuck onto his skin, and they rip it off? And the frustration and the anger that the Romans had to the Jews and the amount of torture that Jesus went through in getting ready to go onto the cross... So we see that they mocked him. And then verses, uh, we have uh, verses 21 through 32, the, the actual crucifixion. We see that as he is carrying, that the, the cross, is the, 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 the beam that is on his back is too heavy. I mean, man, when it's 100 degrees outside, we don't want to work. 
I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the hotter it gets, the less I want to do outside. All right? And so, uh, I mean, he, he's been, I mean, his body is so overwhelmed with all, all the things that he's gone through. And he, that as Jesus carries that cross to Golgotha on the uh, Villa de la Rosa, that road, that there's an, there's an onlooker there. Simon, Simon, as he's passing by and looking, the Romans see that Jesus can't carry it himself. His body is too weak. They pull this man and tell him, grab it and help him get up there. So this, this, this Simon, this, this guy that just sitting there watching what's going on, is there because of the Passover, Helps Jesus carry the cross. They bring him in verse 22, the place called the place of Golgotha, verse 23, and they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh. So that they, when he gets there, they set him in. The, they put the cross in the hole and they nailed him to the cross, and he's up there. So on the third hour, this is nine o'clock in the morning. He's on the cross. And it says, while he's on the cross, they get some, it says they, we have no idea who the they are. Could have been some of the women that would follow him, Mary Magdalene, maybe his mother. It could have maybe even been some of the others that had followed him. And maybe it would, could have been some doctors there, and they, they got him some wine that is mixed with myrrh, which is basically to help a, a narcotic of some sort to help ease the pain, you know, kind of, you know, uh, that maybe you and I would take uh, that today to help ease the pain, or uh, so we don't feel the pain. But they, they, they. That's what this was. This wine mixed with myrrh was, and it says that Jesus received it not. He rejected it. Why? Why would Jesus? In so much pain, because they would. Get, this is something that was common that they would give to those who were being crucified on a cross uh, to help with the pain. Why would Jesus refuse this this aid to help with the pain? Because we remember that Jesus says He was going to take the whole cup. Remember that He asked He asked the Father in the garden. To, will you take this cup away from me? But we discussed how Jesus wasn't going to, he said, not my will, but thine be done. So he was willing to take the whole cup. And so what Jesus, Jesus refusing that narcotic, that, uh, that pain reliever, so to speak, he was saying, I am going to take the full, full wrath of God and nothing is going to interfere all that pain he's gone through, and he's on the cross, and somebody was trying to maybe be in kind and to give him something to help relieve the pain, and he refused it. It says, when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them. What every man should take. Psalm 22, of course, prophesies about this. It wasn't bad enough that the Roman soldiers had to do what they did, but they had to strip him naked and put him on the cross. The shame that Jesus had and what he went through of being on the cross, it was not shameful enough of being... I mean, listen, he was in worse condition than the two thieves because... The two thieves didn't have Jesus. Uh, to have the soldiers, the band of soldiers, mocking him and placing the crown of thorns on their heads and stripped him naked and on the cross. And of course, they put in, in verse twenty-five, and it was the third hour. They crucified him at nine o'clock in the morning, and the superscription which. Was a, the accusation, of course, back then we history tells us that they would always put the what the person being crucified on, what they were accused of, and Pilate 
not, not liking the Jews, having disdain for the Jews. Of course, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And, of course, Jesus said, you're the one saying it. He put on there, on the subscription, the king of the Jews, just to laugh at the face of the Jews. To say, this is your king, and you are crucifying him. Put on uh, the subscription that, of course, we, we knew Pilate didn't find anything wrong with Jesus. And what evil, he, he tried to release him, but, of course, the chief priests had, all, had got the crowd all together yelling to crucify him. Not only were they had the subscription, but the two thieves on his right hand, on the left hand, it says that they even were railing on him. And it's in verse 29, and they that passed by railing on him, wagging their heads. So listen, this is, this is, this is just something coming out in the open. You and I, when we, in our mind, when we're thinking of Jesus being crucified on the cross, we're thinking, you know, th this might be uh, somewhere where not a whole lot of people in, in, in Jerusalem or in Israel were, would know about it. No, this was out in the open, and, and people were passing by. I remember one scene in that, in that TV show, The, the Chosen, when G, they had a scene where Jesus walked by some people being crucified, and it looked on there, listen, listen, those that were crucified in that day, people would walk by. This was just a public road. And it says that as he hung there naked and, and bleeding and everything on the cross, people would pass by railing on him and says, Oh, look at this guy. He, he was preaching that he would, he would take down the temple and, and on the third day and build it again. And three days, within three days, it'd be built again. Save yourself. And you had the chief priest railing on him also as, as they're sitting there watching him and, and railing on him and and then it says, and they said unto him that, listen, if you be the Christ, if you are the Son of God, bring yourself down that we may see it. Then, then we will believe it. Kind of convenient, isn't it? I got to see it to believe it. That's the world we live in today. See, all these people were passing by, railing on him. Why? Because Jesus didn't meet their expectations. Remember Judas? Went out and conspired with the chief priests. We discussed this, uh, it's been about a month ago, where Judas had different expectations of who Jesus was supposed to be. They're like, we know the Old we know, we call it the Old Testament, but the chief priests were like, we know the law. You're supposed, the, 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 our Messiah is supposed to be the, he's supposed to be a king. He's supposed to be one that gets us out of uh, uh, these, the Roman rule and put us back on top of the political spectrum. That's who our Messiah is supposed to be. But Jesus, he didn't meet that profile that they, who they thought that Jesus was supposed to be. Well, we know that when Jesus does come back and he does and institutes his millennial reign, he will be be the king. He will be the hierarchy on the political spectrum. He will rule the world, but what they missed is everything that Isaiah said he was going to be and that King David said he was going to be in the Psalms and totally forgot about how he was going to come to this earth and die a horrible death. They forgot about all that and they rejected the Messiah. As many today reject Jesus because he's not who they thought he would be. And so they pass by railing on him. Listen, listen, you and I have seen enough old westerns in the day, back in the day, when, some, when there was a big old crowd, when somebody was getting ready to be hung, or like that movie Braveheart, you had all these people watching William Wallace to be headed. You, we've all seen movies. Listen, this was entertainment to them. Today we would be like, well, what are you thinking? That's someone being tortured and 
killed on a cross, that's not entertainment. But th- th- this, is, this is what they were do. They were entertained by the, the death of Jesus. In verse 33, and when the sixth hour, about noon, so this is three hours that he's been on that cross, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So from the third hour that he was crucified on the cross to the ninth hour, six hours he was on a cross Alive, being crucified. And from that sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was complete darkness. God turned his back on his son. That's what this darkness was showing. That God turned his back on his son. And that ninth hour... We hear that when, he, when God turned his back on his son, we hear Jesus saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, they said, Well, he's calling for Elias, or he's doing this, or he's doing that. And I mean, can you imagine at 12 o'clock noon, darkness? I mean, to me, I would be like, what is happening? But not these folks. They were so bent of Jesus being crucified that even one of the centurions, one of the guardsmen, in verse 39 said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. A pagan. Not even a Jew came to the realization of everything that's happened. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. And then as the women there, they tried to give him some vinegar. It says he received the vinegar because it wasn't the wine, but he rece- they gave him some vinegar. And Jesus, Mark doesn't record it, but when John records it, when Jesus dies, what does he say? Three words. It is finished. For every single believer, those words have one meaning. Victory. We have victory. over Not only over our sin, but we have victory over the punishment of our sin. As John records, it is finished and he, and he gives up the ghost. He dies. And of course we know that Joseph takes his body, buys some nice linen and puts him in that burial place, that sepulcher that is hewn out of stone. Though today that that sepulcher is covered up with dirt, after so many dis- destruction, uh, wars in Jerusalem and it's covered with dirt, we know what happened on the third day. Don't we? We know in Mark chapter 16 that on the third day when Mary Martha came to the tomb and of Jesus and saw that the angel had they didn't see it, but the, the, the stone was rolled away, and Jesus tells them, they don't recognize it, go, go tell 
the apostles and Peter. Right? Go tell, go tell the disciples and Peter that he's going to meet you in Galilee. And so that third day, the first day of the week, the tomb is empty. So again, why did Jesus, why was he crucified? Why was he buried and why was he risen on the third day? What the cross shows One man says this, Jesus' cross is the pulpit in which God used to preach, I love you. The cross was a picture of what Jesus told Nicodemus. Jesus told Nicodemus, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, Jesus says you can have everlasting. It's not something that you can lose. It's everlasting. It's Bible. It's what Jesus himself said. That if you place your faith, your trust in Jesus, you have everlasting life that's what the cross is it's God saying I love each and every single one of you and because I love you your sin has to be paid for which it talked Mark talks about how the veil in the temple to the holy of holies was rent from the top to the bottom you know, every year they had to go, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of the sacrificial lamb onto the mercy seat and onto there to make an atonement to, for the sins. And when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was rent from top to bottom showing that he is the sacrificial lamb. Listen, all, G, all the Bible tells us, all Jesus says is to have everlasting life is to put your faith in me. Even one of the thieves later realized that Jesus was God. And said to him, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. He realized who Jesus was. And Jesus, while the thief was on the cross, told him, today you will be with me in paradise. Why? Because there was a knowledge that went from here to here. There's a lot of folks out there that know of Jesus. I mean, we have the Ten Commandments that come on every spring. And, you know, there, listen, the world, a lot of folks in the world know of Jesus. They, 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 they know of him a little bit, but they don't know Jesus. And Jesus says, I love you so much that if you put your faith in me, that, that, he, that he loves you so much that whosoever believeth in him, that's faith, should not perish but have everlasting life. But the problem between you and I having everlasting life is this little three-letter word that the Bible calls sin. It has to be dealt with. And when Jesus died on that cross, he made that payment for your sin. He wrote that check with his own blood. And in the memo, he put paid in full. 
And all God asks for us is to trust him, to put our faith in him. In order for your sin to be paid for, you have to put your trust in him. All the thief on the cross had to do was put his faith in him. I've watched that video of Alistair Begg. There's a video that you can watch where he kind of talks about the thief. Where Alistair Begg describes that the thief going to heaven and being at the there and being at the pearly gate, so to speak, and having the, 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 the thing that he did which caused him to be crucified, that Peter was asking him, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And Alistair Begg says, well, the one in the middle said I could be. Folks, you don't have to give so much money to become a believer. You don't have to even be baptized to be a believer. You don't have to have your name on a church roll to be a believer or to go to heaven. Your ticket is punched when you place your faith, your trust in Jesus alone. In Christ alone. That's it. But the thing is, is I can't make that decision for you. Your mom can't make that decision. Your dad can't make that decision. Your grandpa, your grandma can't make that decision for you. This is a decision that only you and you alone can make. Because one day, when your heart quits beating and this body dies... You immediately, your soul is going to be meeting God. It is appointed unto man once to die. And then, the judgment, you're all, we're all going to die. The question is this. Will you, be, will you meet God as a family member? Or will you be meeting God as his enemy? And how you meet him is all determined what you do with Jesus. That is the determining factor. Nothing else. So my question to you this morning is this. Do you remember a time in your life where you put your faith and your trust in Jesus alone for your salvation, for your payment of your sin? I'm not saying, well, I pray to him all the time. No, that's not what I'm asking. Listen, a lot of folks pray, but they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe that he died on the cross. They don't believe that he is the, as he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man coming to the Father but by me. There's a lot of folks out there that pray. I'm not asking you if you prayed. I'm asking you, do you remember a time where you made that conscious decision to put your faith, your trust in Jesus alone to get you into heaven? If you have not, would you make that decision today? In a moment, Miss Ruth's going to come up here and we're going to have what we call an invitation. That invitation is for you that if you want to receive Jesus today, that you can come forward and you can let me know and we can take you from uh, take the Bible down what we call the Romans Road and show you how the Bible says that you receive Jesus. Romans 10 verse 9 tells us exactly how we put our faith and our trust in him. And verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that invitation is also an invitation for those of you who already believe to come up and if the Holy Spirit and the word of God being preached has convicted you of something to come up to this altar, what we call this altar here and to Lay it down, what we sell, that we say to lay down your burdens or to lay down whatever it is that you've been doing. 
and to repent and to what we call get right with Jesus, to confess what you've done. To renew that walk with him. But my focus this morning is on those of you that are visitors and those of you who have been coming to the Groth Road Baptist Church. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure that heaven's your home? If you were to die today and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? If you're not sure, then I invite you, after I pray and the music begins to play, would you come this morning and receive the gift of salvation that Jesus paid for on that cross? Father.